Tell us about the healing circle. The circles, um, and they were primarily at the prison when I, the, all the initial ones. It was to promote healing for the survivors who came and talked. And you know, every time it was music to my ears, the number of survivors that would say, if any would have, anyone would have told me that I would find healing in a maximum security prison of felons, I would have told them I was crazy, and that's where I find my healing. But also to see, have the men experience some empathy and humanity and really care in a way they've never experienced it in their life. And, I, you know, the comparison between my life, where I had so much of that in my, in my, my um, family of origin, and so many of them had none of it, um, was really striking. And to see them, I mean, I remember one guy, he had almost no teeth, and we were sitting on the floor doing a drawing during the, this process, and he looked up and he said, you know, I know those barbed wires are still out there, but for three days I felt free. You know, to have people have that kind of experience when they've never had, and they, the men would always say they hated to have this process end. Those three days to them, were, you know, was amazing. And I would run into men sometimes in another institution, sometimes seven years later, and they would remember particularly the names of the survivors in that experience. And so um, what did I want? I wanted God to do God's work. I mean, I had no agenda um, other than people were treated respectfully and it was a safe environment for people to tell their stories. Um, but different miracles happened in different circles. What is the foundation of restorative justice? The philosophical foundation of restorative justice is based on a few principles. One is that it's victim-focused. So unlike the criminal justice system, which is offender-focused, and rightfully so because of due process rights and things, this is a, a victim-focused. And victim can be tight in the sense it can be an individual who's been victimized. I often talk about ripples. Or it can be all sorts of people who've been harmed. So if you have the sexual assault of a woman, for example, she is the direct victim. But her partner, her husband, her children, her colleagues, I mean, those are all ripples. And those people are also impacted in different ways and maybe not as severely as she is. But um, so you've got victim focus. The second question is, what was the harm? And that, we look at that much more critically than the criminal justice system. And the third question is, how do we go about repairing the harm? And repairing the harm can involve everything as small as making restitution and as big as trying to mend a broken heart, um, trying to bring some peace to somebody who does, hasn't had peace since the time of crime. How do you prepare for the circle? There are different kinds of group processes, and so part of it is it depends what you are trying to do. I, not, I don't mean control the outcome, because I, as I said before, I don't want to control the outcome. So the victim has a safe place to share his or her story of not only what happened, but what's happened since, how their lives have changed. Anybody who's faced and been a victim of a traumatic crime will always tell you there's life before and life after. There, you know, and sometimes people use the word healed or closure, and victims will tell you there's no such thing because their life has changed. So there may be healing, as my one of my victims told me. There are ING words. There are forgiving and healing, but it doesn't mean it's over. And so um, to be able for for victims to voice in some way the harm and the people around them to voice the harm. The offender has the opportunity to share his or her perspective, but really often a new understanding of the harm they've caused. And for me to understand that just because someone in the circle doesn't express that they've been touched, almost everybody's been touched. And um, you know what they do with it, frankly, they're, they're free to do what they want with it. How do you arrive in the circle? 
there's prayer and stillness. I have to go in with a still heart because I'm asking people to open and to share. And if I look like I'm not in that place, they will not. When I'm gathering a group, I try to think about who ought to be there, um, what voice maybe hasn't been heard that needs to be heard. I think about the questions I'm going to ask. I'm very mindful that I want to ask a question that anybody can answer. And they can go, I would say, as deep as they want or as close to the surface. So um, when, when I did a lot of circles in the central city with police officers and people from the city, um, my question was, share a specific experience of the impact of violence in your life. Everybody can answer that. Even somebody who lives in River Hills in a gated house can say, I live in River Hills with a gated house because I'm afraid. Um, but people have much more experience than that. And so when you ask a question broad enough and inviting enough, people can, um, you know, I remember the man who said he never runs anywhere because everybody assumes he's committed a crime and so he can't run for a bus, he can't run in his neighborhood. Um, I remember another man saying that he went down his street and there were balloons on a, a stairwell up to this duplex um, because it was a birthday party. And as he was walking down the street, the little kid said, Mr. Mr., are you going there? And he said, yes. And they said, who died? Because the kids were used to seeing balloons at child funerals. And then people who have lost loved ones and much more brutal experiences, or the police officer who talked about having a child in his hands as she had a bullet hole in her head and having her die in his arms and sleeping and thinking and praying about her and saying to the group, I always take her with me when I get calls. And so I want to be able to set a tone and a question that invites those opportunities for people. Um, if the question is too narrow or too specific, um, some people are gonna feel it doesn't apply to them. And so I have to be mindful of that. And part of it is telling stories myself. I, I rarely will start a circle without telling some stories, either they're my personal stories or stories of others to help people feel comfortable with it. I also, just this is sort of a trick of the trade, I often try to put somebody next to me that I know will be willing to tell a story because once somebody opens up, people feel much more comfortable opening up themselves. You know, and then there's sort of the pragmatic, you know, how am I going to control it that people are not leaving early because we've gone too long and just, you know, those kinds of things. And I have to try to hold that in the right place because I have to be concerned. But I don't want to be so concerned with that that I, that I close the door on what's happening in the circle. How do you create a safe place for those in the circle? There's a lot of teaching in dispute resolution about active listening. And active listening is a head thing. You know, that you're really, you are listening and taking in information and that you're able to then either repeat it if you need to or use it. This is more. This is trying to be there with that person that they, as they look around and see the faces of people, that people are really opening their hearts in support of what they're saying. And it's, it's funny because some of it's counterintuitive. We tell people, I don't want you running to hug somebody. I mean, we can pass the Kleenex around. But it, we want to create a safe place, really a zone of safety for the person who's talking. And people can see when other people's eyes are on them and listening and sometimes tears coming down other people's faces that they are being held um, by that circle. You know, and that heart, that heart stuff touches you, transforms you, and also gives rise to you responding in love. 
I mean, there, there's, it, there's no question that there is a huge amount of love in that room, despite the fact that if you step back and think about some of the things that some of the men did, you would think there's a total absence of love. And, uh, but it goes back to the humanity that's in the room and, and uh, trying to connect with that. You know, I love listening to my community members who'll say, you know, I was afraid to walk in the prison this morning, and now I don't want to leave these guys. They're like my sons. You know, they could have been they could have been my next door neighbor. You know, and I, sometimes I have to remind them <laughs> that you know they have committed serious crimes. I mean, this isn't we didn't just sweep up nice people and put them in prison. There's some people that are wrongfully there, but but they've committed terrible crimes. But I want them to see that other face of them. Because in terms of hope and, re and redoing the criminal justice system and all the things that we talk about, you have to see that there is a humanity and um, promise in individuals that if you give them the opportunity and support they need, that they in fact could become part of our, of our community. Why is the talking piece so important? Yeah, I love the talking piece. You know, the natives often will use an eagle feather because of its spiritual meaning, or a talking stick um, that has a lot of spiritually significant pieces, whether it's feathers or bells or stones or things on it, um, because it's so profoundly uh, spiritual for the natives where, from which this tradition comes. Um, I often use a smooth rock, um, and it doesn't matter so much what's being used. In the intro, spending time talking about the sacredness of this piece, and when I think of all the people that have held it in the past and shared their stories um, from their heart, and that now people are gonna have that opportunity to hold that same talking piece. But what it does is you, you tell people, and the fact that it's going to be passed to one person and that that person is in his or her safe place. No one's going to interrupt, no one's going, and really it's not to be judged, it's for them to be able to tell their story. And there's power in that that's not describable. I mean, it's spiritual to me. Why people have such a comfort level of that talking piece that reveal things that you think people would never reveal. And what it forces the rest of the circle to do is to listen with their hearts because they don't have an opportunity, other than the person next to the one who has the talking piece. No, by the time the talking piece gets to them, it's gonna be long on another topic. So it's not people thinking, well, what am I gonna to say to this or my story isn't as good. And one of the things, one of my many intro pieces is, you know, when you're thinking about what to say, whatever comes into your mind, go with it. There's a reason it popped into your head. And don't spend time thinking, well, I could come up with a bitter story, or if he told that story, I should tell that story. I said, just settle in on whatever you decided to tell and sit with it and listen to others. And invariably, I'll say, your story's gonna influence somebody in the circle. I mean, I've seen that happen over and over again, that the strangest story somehow touches somebody that you wouldn't think would be touched by the story. And so I said, you know, that's, to me, it's the spirit working and how this all interrelates and brings healing to people, that your story means something to somebody else. And you hear the men saying how that, how these stories have touched them in ways that they didn't think was possible. How does a circle empower and unite? It's the whole transformational spirit of the circle. People feel connected, they feel safe, um, and deservedly safe. I mean, I that's my experience at least. Um, and people, build on other people's stories. If you're willing to share this with me and express that pain, let me share what's in my mind, in my heart. Um, and as, I mean, I have been amazed. I have done a number of circles, for example, in a law school class, and asked some broad question about 
Tell us about somebody who played an important role at a difficult moment. Invariably, I'll have two co-eds talk about being sexually assaulted. These are with classmates that they barely know, that they've never talked to, but feel safe enough in this environment to share those stories. And when they share those stories, other people share their really deep meaning stories. Um, yeah, I mean, there's so many times people will say, I've never told anybody. I've never told anybody. I've had inmates talk about, I've had gang leaders talk about being sexually assaulted as a child and preface it by saying, I've never told anybody this story. And what happens, um, for example, in a prison when you have a leader, a gang leader or somebody, sharing a story like that, at the break, suddenly he'll be surrounded by another, a group of men for whom that story rang true and they go talk to him and ask him about what he's done and how he's coped with it and thank they I hear I've heard them thank you for your bravery in coming here and telling that story which reaffirms everybody's willingness to tell a story when people are appreciative um, of that honesty and and the victims will say to the men thank you for your honesty here you know, people that are willing to admit to things they've done, maybe even things they haven't been caught for, but that they they are so motivated by what the strength of that circle and the, and the sense of community that they've never experienced before that they they want to be able to put that out there, and then from that flows often healing. Where did the concept of the circle originate? The talking circle, the circle, is based very much on native traditions. A number of tribes, the Navajos particularly, um, but there's also the First Nation peoples of Canada, um, the Malawi tribe in New Zealand, and so, and the sense of the circle is that it is a sacred process. Um, and we think about often a native city around a fire, and I, I like to have a candle often or something that people can kind of concentrate in the middle. But th there are circles, whether it's meant to be a decision-making circle or a healing circle or restorative justice where somebody has committed a crime and they bring the community together, or whether it's, you know, trying to decide something, they... Gather elders. Elders are very important in a lot of those traditions. So there are senior elders who will all will represent the community as well as others who are involved. And the talking piece is really there's a whole ceremony about it. But the whole idea is that they're all family, and this is a chance for family to come together. And so that concept of community is really critical, and that's really what the circles are based on. Now, the victim-offender dialogue is more the Mennonites um, and other kinds of traditions, but the circles themselves are based on Native traditions. How do you process what you've shared or heard at the circle? It's quiet time. It's quiet time. It's out walking. It's um, particularly a highly emotional circle. Um, you're not ready to process it after you've been through it. I mean, it, it, that comes over the next several days, um, just trying to quiet down and a sense of gratitude. I mean, I prayer is often one of gratitude. Um, I really feel so blessed that I have the opportunity to do this work and that people trust me enough to set that kind of tone that they're willing to tell their stories. And um, it really is just sitting with that and being grateful. Why is the circle so important in today's world? To me, the lack of listening in our culture is the foundation of many of our troubles. Um, because it's only by listening to the people's experiences, not their opinions, but their experiences, that you learn how to walk in their shoes. To understand, maybe not to agree with the choices they've made, but to understand how they view the world and why they may have made choices they do. And, and uh, it's such a gift to be able to hear somebody share that kind of an experience. 
And so, um, you know, I, I laughed, there's that old expression that, you know, when you've got a hammer, the whole world looks like a nail. Well, for me, the whole world needs a circle. I mean, whether it's political problems or, you know, any of the divisiveness that we see going on, I just think, you know, even on the racial issues, if, and I've done circles like that, where you have African-American um, individuals and, and some others, some Latinos and others and whites sit in a circle and to share individual stories of having experienced, whether it's racism or sexism or other things. And it opens it up for everybody. I mean, the people of color often are surprised at what the Anglo white people say. And certainly people who are not people of color are surprised and learn from the stories of people of color. And so I, to me, it's the foundation of everything. And that's how we get back to connectivity is to have listened with our hearts and understand um, what others have gone through. How do you define forgiveness? Forgiveness is complicated. Part of the complication from forgiveness is people have very different definitions of what that means. Um, and what I, when I'm talking to survivors about that issue, I tell them that I believe that no human is capable of divine forgiveness. We're talking about something else. Um, that somebody who has sustained trauma can't simply say it's okay and move on. And I, I like to think that's what the holy forgiveness is, that if you're true to your heart of asking for forgiveness, you get it. So, um, I am a believer, and I, I talk to people about how they see forgiveness. I'm talking about biblical forgiveness and other forgiveness. But to my definition, and I talk to people because victims have to have their own definition, um, involves um, a softening of a heart from the trauma and the wrong, and perhaps seeing the event through different eyes. That's not to mean there's healing from it, but it means that maybe there's new understanding that the person who committed the crime had some humanity behind himself or herself. It might mean um, seeing an opportunity to, to um, grow from this trauma that hit you and to be able to give to others. It's letting go of the personal rage internal. And it's all about the person who's been harmed. It's not about the person who's harmed the person. Now it's nice, anybody who's done anything bad likes to hear they're forgiven. And you know, and, and that certainly happens in victim offender dialogues. But more importantly, it's how the survivor feels about whether they're on a more hopeful path after they've gone through a restorative process. Um, and as my friend Lynn, my survivor, says, it's an ING word. Some days you feel like you have successfully forgiven somebody, and then the next day you haven't. And so she says, you know, you're always hoping you're moving primarily in a forward way rather than a backward way, but it can trigger just like that, and you can be back full of anger. And that's okay. Um, and so I, I worry, I tell, particularly church groups, the importance of not telling survivors, you just need to forgive him. Because I can tell you from talking to survivors, that's about the worst thing you can tell them. They often, that's the end of church for them usually. Um, and say, look, don't ask me to do something else. I'm the one that was hurt. Um, so, you know, I do think it's a byproduct because I see survivors you know, it's very personal, and but I tell people to be easy on themselves on this, that that's not something that they're gonna check a box on. What is justice? Everybody wants justice, and uh, I don't know what that is. I think fairness is a word that fits. Um, I think having respectful processes and outcomes is something. Um, but people see for justice as often through their own eyes about what they think, you know, that he ought to be put to death or that, um, you know, something bad should happen to that person or that I should be 
receive something that I can't receive. And people are very disappointed in our justice system if they think they're going to get that kind of justice. Um, so I, it's not a word that I use real often in restorative justice. I like the word of healing and moving forward and building bridges and listening and all those active verbs as opposed to obtaining justice. Um, because I, 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 it's not a language that I think particularly victims after our, long after a crime has been committed will use. Um, to them, there is, there is no, justice would be total restoration. And at least in traumatic events, that's not gonna happen. You can't be totally restored to what you were before it happened. What role does accountability play? With accountability comes an understanding of the harm. It is very critical that people who have harmed somebody understand the level and the depth and the breadth of the harm they've caused. And that's really one of the beauties of restorative processes, even the Truth and Reconciliation Commissions, that not only is a victim or victim's family member heard, but then an offender can understand that they may have committed a crime in a moment, but the ripples of that, the harm that go out from that event, sometimes lasts forever. I think that's so important um, to have accountability for the harm, not accountability for the criminal charge, but accountability for the crime and a sense of remorse and a, a, and a sense that comes with that, a dedication to trying to repair harm. How does the circle impact you personally? Well, that's the miracle of the circle. I'm in awe. I'm just in awe how people who I've not, I don't know, who I've not spent time with, suddenly open themselves up and speak from the heart. Um, it really is the hand of God. I mean, I just, and I see the impact that has on others. It's miraculous. It's the foundation. It's where I experience faith. It's where I see God.